Well, hey everybody, and welcome to Groundswell Online. Jeremy here, so great to have you joining us today in this way. Whenever you're joining us for this gathering or wherever you're joining us from for it, hey, it's so great to be able to gather together in this way with you today. If it's one of your first times joining us at Groundswell, then we just wanna say an extra special warm welcome to you. Thanks for taking the step to join us here today in this way. If you're looking to get more connected with us at Groundswell, please just check out some of the links in the video description below. There are a number of links there that are gonna be helpful for you you and just getting in the loop on all that's going on in the days and the weeks ahead. Find the links to our social media, to Facebook and Instagram. Both of those you can find on the, those social media apps at Groundswell NS. That's our tag. Uh, and you also should check out the connection card. That's just a quick online connection card that you're going to be able to fill it really quickly and will allow us to get you on our email list and to keep you in the loop again on all that's going on at Groundswell in the days and the weeks ahead. And there are a bunch of things going on at the day, in the days and the weeks ahead. I just want to highlight a couple of those for you. For one, if you're someone who is new to Christianity, maybe you wouldn't call yourself a Christian yet, you have questions about faith, about church, about God, you should check out Alpha. Alpha is a great judgment-free zone for people to come and have conversations about some of the biggest questions of life. And Alpha is kicking off at our Truro location that's at 759 Prince Street in Truro on Wednesday, April the 6th. And so this is gonna be starting at 6.30. The doors are gonna open for that every Wednesday night that it's happening at 6.15 and then there's actually gonna be a meal happening at 6.30 and so that'll kind of kick off the night and then there'll be a time for, for discussion and talking about some of these questions. And so if that's you, would really encourage you to consider checking out Alpha. You can get more information about Alpha on our website, groundswellchurch.ca or find the link for that in the video description below. Another thing for our GS Kids families, on Saturday, April the 9th from 3 to 5 p.m., we are hosting again our amazing race Easter edition. So we're really pumped to be partner, partnering with Cornerstone Assembly in Truro to host the amazing race. It's going to be a ton of fun, bunch of activities driving in and around Truro. Uh, it's going to start at Cornerstone and it's going to end at uh, Groundswell with a free barbecue. And so this is going to be a great Easter event for the whole family. Registration is going to be opening that for that in the days ahead. So make sure that you are in the loop, that you're checking out our social media so that you can see when registration goes live for that. But that is Saturday, April the 9th from 3 to 5 p.m. One other thing that we want you to be in the loop on is that we are going to be hosting baptisms on Sunday, April the 17th, Easter Sunday, and it's going to be awesome. And so if you're someone who has put their faith in Jesus but has not yet taken the step to be baptized, we would really encourage you to take this next step in your faith journey. This is really just the next step for anyone who has put their faith in Jesus to now publicly declare that, that, that I have decided to follow Jesus and to live my life for him. And we understand that you may have questions about baptism, what it looks like, who's it for, what it really means to be baptized. If that's you, please feel free to get in touch with us. You can email me, jeremy at grantswellchurch.ca. You can reach out through our Facebook page, but we would love to connect with you about being baptized. If you're interested in being baptized on Easter Sunday, it's gonna be such a special time together and we would love to have a conversation with you about that. Uh, today is going to be a great time together and we're so excited that you've joined us for it. We're going to have a message coming from Pastor Tammy in the next week of our fruitful series on the fruit of the Spirit. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to the worship band who's going to lead us in a song together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of way it was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met you, you called my name.
things you can remember from your childhood. Sometimes it's just random things like how my grandmother's house used to always sort of have this faint smell of tea because just like any good Maritimer, she always had a pot of tea simmering on the stove. Or other times it can be something very specific, like a specific event. Like the time I got detention for getting mad at this kid who was picking on me and so I threw my apple from recess in her hair, hit her in the head, you know, things like that. There are also people that stick out to us, like teachers who shaped your elementary school experience. The, the first teachers that often come to mind are, well, the ones you didn't like. Sort of like my grade primary teacher, Miss Rogers. She was scary and strict and stern. She, she had one of those, um, they're like these pointer sticks that sort of look like a pen, but it would extend out like a radio antenna. I'm re realizing that some of you probably have no idea what a radio antenna is, but it would, it would come apart and get longer and she would walk around our classroom and snap it on your desk if she didn't like what you were doing. Or maybe you remember the fun teachers, you know, the ones that would let you kind of do things that the other teachers didn't. But, but sometimes it's the kind teachers who kind of slipped under the radar. Maybe we don't remember as much or at least until you're older and you can actually appreciate their kindness. You know, the ones who were sweet and compassionate, who were gentle with their words, maybe even slightly soft-spoken and didn't really seem to have a mean bone in their body. I feel like we appreciate those teachers more once we get a little bit older. Kindness is often a quality that is overlooked and undervalued, at least until you've been the recipient of someone's kindness. I think I've maybe told this story before, but in my later elementary years, I wasn't the most popular kid and my classmates used to actually pick on me a lot. And the teacher I had was so very kind to me. She always made sure that my desk was close to hers she would give me tasks to do during recess so that I didn't actually have to go out and play on the playground. The other students, I'm sure, thought I was a teacher's pet and they, well, I know they did. They gave me a hard time about it. But looking back, I realized that it was her compassion and her kindness. She was actually watching out for me, keeping me close by to protect me from the words and the actions of the other students. Have you ever been the recipient of real kindness? And when we think about kindness, words like 
nice and pleasant usually pop into our heads. We think about people who are gentle, smiling, you know, people who get along with everybody and aren't causing any problems. It almost seems like kindness can feel a bit sort of boring and mundane. So why is it that Paul puts kindness in this list of the fruit of the Spirit? Now, in this series, we have been focusing on one line of scripture from Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, being kind doesn't seem that difficult, right? Or how about goodness? We're going to look at kindness and goodness today. Now, most of us would say that we're a good person, right? Wouldn't you say that about yourself? Sometimes the world's understanding of a word, though, and the biblical understanding of a word, the biblical meaning, it can be actually significantly different. Now, we live in such an interesting time in history. Social media has kind of created this strange sort of billboard where posts about love and and peace and kindness are seen almost as actions. And if you don't post, your silence is seen as some sort of affirmation of a contrary position or a lack of compassion and kindness. And yet, humanity struggles on the daily to just simply be kind. Like, read the comments of any post and the nasty arguments that ensue. Listen to how people speak to the cashier at the grocery store or how families talk to each other across the dinner table in a restaurant. We can be cruel. And often, even when we're being kind towards someone, If we're being honest, our motives are actually very selfish. Now, maybe an easy way to explain what true biblical kindness looks like is to sort of paint a picture of false kindness. False kindness is when you are useful to someone or you extend kindness to someone only when it's beneficial to you, when you will have something to gain from it. Like when other people will see what you're doing or notice it and it'll boost your reputation. Sometimes we use false kindness to get what we want. It looks like kindness, but it's really manipulation. Or there are contingencies attached to it. I'll do this kind thing for you, but I'm going to expect something in return. And if I don't get that something in return, I'm going to hold my kindness over your head. False kindness comes in in the form of self-preservation. Like, I have to do it or people will kind of see the real me. Or we extend kindness not for the benefit of someone else, but so that we can actually feel good about ourselves. True kindness is actually taught to us in Ephesians 4 verses 32 and thir- 31 and 32 where it says, Get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Biblical kindness is the complete absence of all of those things, of uh, absence of bitterness. It's biblical kindness is generous. It flows to those we agree with and also those that we don't. Those we know and those who kind of just pass through our lives. True kindness is extended to those who will never thank us or acknowledge us. People we love and people we don't. True kindness means meeting the needs of others without a desire for recognition, without throwing it in their face, without grumbling or complaining. True kindness means self-sacrifice when it's 
inconvenient, without concern or self-preservation. It's meeting real needs in God's way, in his timing, and his manner. Now, maybe kindness actually doesn't seem so mundane and easy at all. Maybe it's actually a lot harder than it looks. I remember as a child driving one night with my parents and I'm not even sure if we were going somewhere or if we were heading home from somewhere, but I guarantee you we were late regardless because we were always, we were always late. And I was sitting in the back seat with my two sisters. And I remember that it was raining pretty hard that night and we were, we were driving along on this road and up ahead my dad saw someone who was walking along the side of the road. And as we got closer, this guy, he turned around and stuck out his thumb to try to hitch a ride. So here we were, full car, it's pouring down rain, three kids in the back seat. And my dad pulls over and picks this guy up. Let me just tell you, we were not remotely impressed. And my mom was furious. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not advocating for picking up hitchhikers necessarily, but I've often replayed that experience in my mind. My dad did not have to stop. It wasn't convenient, it was quite inconvenient actually, maybe even risky. And we were all mad at him, but he chose to show kindness and compassion. And sometimes I wonder, would I have done that if I were in his situation? Would you? If you were running late to get somewhere, would you stop on the side of the road and help someone in need? Would you go out of your way? to care for someone like that. There's a very familiar parable, story in the Bible that tells of the Good Samaritan. And I think it's a perfect illustration for both kindness and goodness. Now, even if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, you have probably heard the term Good Samaritan. And, and a parable is a story that, that Jesus would use to illustrate a spiritual lesson. He used them all the time. And we're going to pick up this story in the book of Luke in the New Testament in chapter 10, where it says, a teacher of the law, so someone who was educated in the Jewish law, comes to Jesus with a question. Teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, so Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So this guy comes up to Jesus. He clearly is well-educated, he knows the Jewish law, and he asks Jesus this very specific question about one of the most important commands given to God's people. Love the Lord your God. So he clearly understands that part. He, he probably had a pretty clear understanding of what it meant to love the Lord your God. And then it goes on and says, and love the neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. So if the command is to love your neighbor, he wanted some clarification on who his neighbor was. Now, did you notice that it, he, it said he wanted to justify himself? Now this, that line for the first time really stood out to me because how often do we feel the need to justify our actions or to figure out like, kind of the bare minimum that we have to do to get someone's approval or to accomplish something. The Jewish leaders had actually already provided an answer to this question. They had said that only their own people, so the Jewish people were their neighbors. 
while others, other teachers of the law, had actually even restricted it more. And they taught that only those who were your relatives, like your, your own family members, were the real neighbors that this command was referring to. So this guy is looking for some clarification. He wants to know exactly which people he has to love and which people that he doesn't have to love so he can justify his actions. So he comes to Jesus with his question and he receives his answer in this story, in this parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers. So we have this man who is always understood in this story to be Jewish. And he's making this descent from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it would literally mean that in this, in about 32 kilometers, he would be making the, this, this descent of about 4,000 feet. So the terrain was rugged, it was rocky, it was mountainous, and it was dangerous. And traveling alone was known to be risky because there were lots of places where people could kind of hide and jump out at you. And so he's attacked in this story. It continues. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So they take everything that he has, they beat him unmercifully, and they leave him to die. So this is the situation that Jesus describes, and, and it would have been vividly understood by the, the people who were listening, the people who heard it, because this was a common occurrence on this, on this path. And so next, the next part is actually where the, the teaching, the parable comes in, the teaching part of the parable. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So a priest comes along. Also seemingly traveling alone on this journey. And perhaps he had finished his work in the temple and he's returning from Jerusalem. He was returning home, but he does not help the man. Even though he sees him lying on the ground, rather than giving help, he... He actually moves completely to the other side of the road, as far away from the man as he can possibly get, creating as much distance as he can. Now, a priest, someone who also would have understood the law, who was responsible for teaching it to others, he, he really shows no kindness, and he leaves the beaten man on the road, continuing on his way. So Jesus continues with his story. He says, so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. I think Jesus is playing on a, a bit of a theme here. The second guy who passes him by is a Levite. Now the Levites also held positions in the temple and they worked to assist the priests with the ceremonial offerings. He would also be very familiar with the Jewish laws but he too chooses to pass on the other side. He doesn't want to get involved. He wants to stay out of it. He wants to keep his hands clean and not get them dirty. Why has Jesus put these details in this story? Because he still has not answered this guy's question, right? This guy's question was, who is my neighbor? He hasn't answered that yet. So he continues in the story. Why is he setting it up this way? A priest and a Levite pass by, right? The most highly respected of the, of the Jews, of the Jewish people. And they do not understand who their neighbor is. They don't. They don't understand this command, who their neighbor is. But Jesus is about to show, he's about to show this, this man what being a neighbor really looks like. He continues, but a Samaritan, as he traveled came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. So why a Samaritan? Why not a lawyer like the guy he's talking to or uh, just a random citizen? The, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews and they, you know, the hate was mutual. They hated them right back. 
And their hatred was based on the differences in the ways they practiced their faith, each believing that they were right. And you and I both know the atrocities that have been committed in the name of religion. It runs, the anger runs deep, the hatred runs deep. And Jesus is about to create this stark contrast between the religious leaders and a Samaritan who displays the fruit of kindness and goodness. Now, that, so the Samaritan, he also sees this man who is still lying in all his misery. And, the, and some translations say that the Samaritan is moved with compassion. Now, this is an expression we hear used many times when referring to Jesus in the New Testament, that he was moved with compassion, compassion for the crowds that gathered or for individuals who were suffering. He saw their need and was moved to act. And the Samaritan shows the same kindness. This Jewish man, his enemy, is naked, bloody, smelly, and moaning in pain. And Jesus says that the Samaritan man went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So that was like kind of the first aid of the day. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, so that's, that's money, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. It's an extraordinary demonstration of kindness. There is no question that it was inconvenient that none of his friends would admire him for stopping to help an enemy or for placing him on his donkey and, and walking himself the rest of the way, or for taking a day off from work to, to stay with him and care for him to make sure that he was okay. There would also have been no grand gesture of thanks from that Jewish man. He likely wouldn't want anyone to even know what had happened. He, he'd be embarrassed to admit that a Samaritan of all people saved his life. And yet, he was extraordinarily generous. Even when he couldn't stay any longer, he pays the host for like two days wages. And just in case that's not enough, he takes responsibility for any additional expenses for that man's care and he promises to come back and pay it. And so Jesus, as he talks to this, this lawyer, he reverses the question and he says this, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, the real question wasn't, who is my neighbor? The question is, to whom can I be a neighbor? Kindness. Kindness is a reflection of God's relationship with humanity. God has always been kind to us. Even when we don't show that kindness in return, he provides for those who love him and for those who hate him. Even when we don't deserve or want it, he continues to offer us a grace and forgiveness that from an earthly perspective, from a human perspective, it, it actually makes no sense to us. That kindness was demonstrated through Jesus. His kind and his kindness was not selfish. There is no manipulation or self-preservation. While Jesus was dying on the cross, bearing the weight of humanity's sin, he was making arrangements for someone to care for his mother after he died. He prayed that God would forgive those who had tortured and killed him. He spoke kind words of forgiveness to the criminal hanging on the cross next to him. In the New Testament, a book called Titus, uh, chapter three, verses four to seven says, when God our savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, not because we were good, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. 
He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. We should want kindness to grow in us because of the scandalous kindness that has been shown to us. And it's in that type of fertile soil that the fruit of kindness and goodness will grow and our hearts will actually be turned towards meeting the needs of other people. And just to be clear, the goodness that Paul is referring to in the fruit of the Spirit, it's not referring to good actions. It's actually more about the inner person, our character, our integrity. Now, many of us would say that we are a good person, but good is actually a relative term. Like I might say I'm a good guitar player, but if I'm comparing myself to John Mayer, I'm terrible. It's relative to a standard and our goodness as Christians is relative to the standard of God's character. Once a man was running up to Jesus and he knelt down and he called him good teacher and then asked this big complicated question. He called Jesus good teacher just to be polite, but Jesus actually called him out on it because goodness is more than being a smart person or a good teacher. He said, Jesus said, only God is truly good. To say that God is good means that he always does what's right. There is nothing bad or evil or dark about God. So he always chooses to do the right thing. He is good all the time. That means never lying, not even a little bit, not even a little white lie. It means never saying something mean or taking something without permission, something that doesn't belong to you or yelling at your spouse or your kids. It's impossible to be truly good. That's why Jesus said only God is good. But Jesus is God. So when we look at Jesus' life, we see the only human being who has ever been truly good. Jesus was good even when no one was looking. He was good when people tried to kill him, when his friends turned away from him. If only God is good, then how are we supposed to grow that fruit of goodness in our lives? Can we actually ever be good? Goodness starts with accepting that God forgave you through Jesus' death on the cross. Then it continues as the Holy Spirit works inside of you to make you more like Jesus. Our goodness is not determined by what we do or don't do. Our goodness is determined by the very fact that you were created by God. And 1 Timothy 4.4 says, For everything God created is good. The bad things we do, the sin that we often give into does not define us. At the core of our being, that is not who we are. We are created good. In fact, after creating Adam and Eve, God said they were very good. It's a fundamental part of our identity and it's the desire of the Holy Spirit to awaken that goodness, to stir that goodness up in us, to grow that kindness in us so that we can reflect the kindness and goodness of God to the world around us. Now, I don't know about you, but this series, it sort of has me feeling a bit like, you know, that apple that has fallen out of the fruit bowl a couple times and has a few bruises on it and that nobody actually wants to eat. These attributes, these fruit of the spirit, they do not grow naturally in us. It's the work of the Spirit of God in us, revealing, highlighting, convicting us, and then empowering us to live a different way. Now, I'm personally finding it, this whole process, a bit painful because I honestly have a lot of work to do. I, just like you, I know I am not good. I make bad choices. I act irresponsibly. I do things and say things that I regret. And I think we can have the habit of 
trying to kind of beat ourselves up for it, like somehow that will make it better. But what's become very clear to me this week in my own life is that when we hit those places and when we recognize the things that we have done that are not good, that are not kind, that are not demonstrating God's kindness and his goodness to the rest of the world, the thing that we need to do, our part, is to acknowledge it and invite the Holy Spirit to do the work in us, to develop our character more, to, to make us more into the likeness of Jesus. Now, does that mean that we will never make mistakes again? Probably not. But the way that we create fertile soil for the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us is just acknowledging who God is, who we are in light of who God is, and allowing His Spirit to be at work in us shaping us, molding us, convicting us, showing us the areas in our life that we actually need to do some work on. And then we have to follow through. So if you're watching today and you are struggling in those areas of kindness, of goodness, you're not alone. I'm struggling too. And I guarantee you that probably most people that we talk to are in the same boat. So what we need to do is we need to acknowledge it and we need to commit ourselves to the work of the Spirit in us. We need to open up our hearts and our lives and allow God to do in us what only He can do. To pull out the kindness, to pull out the goodness that is innately part of who you are so that we in turn can be a better demonstration of who Jesus is to the world. I'm just going to invite you to join me in that. Join me in allowing the Spirit to do some work on us this week. Let's pray together. Lord God, we, um, we just come to you today acknowledging the areas in our lives where we're struggling, where we've made bad choices, where we haven't taken into consideration how our choices affect other people, where we... Um, are just really kind of struggling in our relationships to even just be kind to people around us. Lord, we want to acknowledge that before you now and invite you to come and do the work in us that only you can do. Lord, we know that um, this is a journey. And in this journey, there are ups and downs. There is no straight up trajectory for us. And that there will be times when we fail and there will be times when we honor you. And so Lord, we pray that you would take our failings and that you would use it as a springboard to help us grow in kindness and goodness and all the other fruit of the Spirit. Lord, we invite your Spirit in to do what only you can do. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you for joining us today, everyone. If we can be praying for you, please email us at prayer at groundswellchurch.ca. Our team would love to be praying for you this week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>